Presented by Caltech. Okay, so we have the equation of motion. We write down a differential equation thinking about acid on springs, circuits, whatever. You get the equation, which is usually a second order differential equation, so Z double dot in the complex plane, plus the damping term, gamma Z dot, plus, na plus natural oscillation, comic and not square Z. And there's some writing piece which we call F naught over M, e to the I comic T, the timing frequency. Alright? How do you solve this? We have a bunch of math from last time. What is the solution? So X of T, which is the real part of Z of T. What is it? Depending on if gamma is less than 2 omega naught, gamma is equal to 2 omega naught, and gamma is more than 2 omega naught. What are my solutions? The first case is when damping is light. It's less than 2 omega naught, so it's lightly damped. What is my solution? Any thoughts about that? What do I like down? <coughs> Do I have just one term or two terms? Two terms, right? The first one is corresponding to the oscillations. Had there been no external force field? The one which corresponds to the complementary solution of the differential equation. So the case we like damping case, it's some initial constant A, e to the minus gamma t over 2. Let's call this another constant. Let's call this C1 um, times cosine omega ut plus phi. Is that it? No. There's also the piece which is forced on by the driven oscillation. So you also have a term A of omega cosine omega t minus delta, which depends on omega. Okay. This is the part which is governed by the steady state solution, the particular solution of my oscillation governed by my driving frequency omega. Okay. What about the case for critically damped? Again, same logic. What's the piece without the driving frequency? The, the complementary solution, C1 plus C2t e to the minus omega naught t. Add on to that the driven piece, which is the same as always. A of omega cosine omega t minus delta omega. And for the over that case, it's some constant C1 e to the minus mu 1t plus C2 e to the minus mu 1t minus mu 2t. Tack on back the solution from the first oscillation A of omega cosine omega t minus delta this to of omega. Okay? So just three different solutions depending on what the conditions are. And as always, it's a set of, it's a, some <coughs> two solutions, the, um, the non-driven pieces and add back to it the steady state solution. Okay? And of course the initial conditions are all contained in C1s, the phi, C1, Z2, C1, Z2. The steady state part is completely determined by my forced oscillation, by omega, by F naught, by omega naught, and by gamma. <coughs> so as a quick recap, um, what is A of omega? The amplitude of the steady state oscillation, which is fixed. Okay? Again, write this down 10, ten times, you'll just remember it all of that. It's not that hard. F naught over M divided by omega naught squared minus omega squared whole squared plus gamma squared omega squared whole to the power one half and tan delta was gamma omega over omega naught squared minus omega squared, okay? So that's the logic behind things. It's some of two solutions, the undamped, uh, the unforced part, and the forced part, okay? So what really happens is that in the steady state, only these solutions, the steady state ones, they remain. All the, the damped versions, they damp out, okay? This one's falling down with time, going down with time, going down with time, okay? So even though, it takes forever, technically, for these pieces to go to zero. The exponentials die out, but they take forever to die out. They die out fast, but they take, you know, it will be zero at infinity time. So technically, they take forever to die out. 
But for all practical purposes, it will be small enough to not worry you. Okay? So only these pieces are like what survives. It's like Olive Garden, if you think about it. They, they claim endless breadsticks, but after a while, you know, it's just not endless anymore. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. This thing is what dominates, even though it's like stay on forever. Okay? That's how you get a solution for these things. And A of omega is determined. You don't go and try out to find A and tan delta by initial conditions. They are determined only for the, for the, for the C1, phi, and C1, C2s. Okay? All right, any questions about this stuff? This is from last time. Are we all on board? You all see what's going on? Okay. I take silence in my own favor. All right, so let's write down A of omega in terms of the quality factor, because as you can think about this, this depends on the rain frequency omega, the natural part omega not and the damping term. So a ratio between the natural part and the, and the damping term tells you how good the, the first oscillation might be, okay? So remember, uh, the quality factor was omega naught over gamma. In that terms, and in terms of ratios of frequencies, not individual omega and omega naught, but the ratios of them, this looks like F naught over M <coughs> omega naught squared times omega naught over omega divided by Omega naught plus omega naught plus omega squared plus 1 over q squared. Take a second, convince yourselves. Quick check, multiply omega omega naught. This picks up omega squared. This is <coughs> omega squared. That gets pulled out. This picks out gamma squared times omega squared because of the, of the square here. Pull it out, one cat power cancel off, you get the same thing back. I just said some things, but just convince yourselves that that's true. I just rewrote that A of omega in terms of the ratios of frequency and the quality factor. Okay? And similarly, and we'll see why this is important. And similarly, time delta in terms of this same <coughs> of omega is one over the quality factor divided by omega naught over omega minus omega over omega naught. Okay. So how do these curves look like for different values of the quality factor? Because the quality factor det determines how good the oscillations are, how long they last. Okay, so let's try and plot out a of omega for different quality factors. So this is a of omega as a function of the ratio omega over omega naught. So resonance happens at one on this plot. Okay, and I'm going to plot a omega normalized by this pesky factor up front. So this is a omega divided by f naught over m omega naught squared. Okay. So I'm just plotting this horrible looking function, which depends only on omega and omega naught, and has some value of the damping term. Question? Is this the power of Oh, yes, thank you. Thanks. Okay. So let's plot them out. That's for some quality factor, Q, okay? What if I increase the quality factor? Does the curve shift to the right or to the left? Does the curve have a larger amplitude or smaller amplitude? Let's look at that first. If I have a larger quality factor, is my maximum of this resonance curve, is this higher than this one or not? Let's look at this. If Q goes up, one over Q squared goes down. That goes down, the denominator goes down, hence the amplitude goes up. Okay, so for higher quality factor, my curves start going up. Okay, so let's say this one was Q1, this is Q2. If I keep going up and up, it just, you know, goes on and on higher values, it comes down like that. Okay, so this is Q3, and in this setting, Q3 is more than Q2. And where is resonance happening on this plot? On the x-axis at, at the value equal to 1, because this is a ratio omega over omega naught. So as q goes to infinity, that means if q is infinity, gamma must be 0. 
That is, there is no damping. In that case, the resonance happens approximately at omega naught. Okay? So roughly somewhere here on this plot is the value 1. And where this curve peaks is not exactly at omega naught, but is damped out of it, depending on what the value of gamma or value of q is. Okay? So how do I find out at what frequency does the curve peak? What do I do? I have a function, a of omega, tells me how it looks like. I want to find its maximum. Just differentiate, okay? So to find the maximum, where these curves are peaking for any particular uh, value of q, we call them omega m, omega max. And I can determine omega max by demanding the fact that dA omega, d omega, zero, is an extrema, and the fact that d squared a over the omega squared at omega m. This is also at omega m. Uh, for minimas, it's positive or negative? Second derivative. Oh, sorry, but on maxima, what do you want? You want negative or a positive value? Negative, negative right? <laughs> so for a maxima, this is negative. You check these conditions. For that value of omega m, which satisfies these conditions, um, you find where the curve is equal to maximum, and when gamma is zero. So when gamma is zero, which means q is infinity, in that case, omega m equals omega naught. Otherwise, it's always less than omega naught. Okay? So the curves are always peaking less than one on this, on this plot, and as q increases, they kind of move towards the resonance point. Okay? So, this is amplitudes for different Qs. The homework is asking for different deltas as a function of Qs. So I've given you a sense of like how to solve it. Think about the curves, think about different Qs, how they look like. Use Mathematica, use MATLAB, you could do that. But you think about the physics that's going on here. The curves become more and more compressed, more and more peaked as Q goes up. As Q goes down, they're more spread out, and they peak at a value much lower than um, omega naught, and the fact that the amplitudes also increase with increasing Qs. So three things happening. Okay? Is that okay? Questions about that? Just use graphics? Yes? So can you explain why that peaks earlier with the smaller value values? What happens? Like why they're shifted from where they're Good. Uh, is that for me? <laughs> Thank you. Um, why is that shifted? Good question. So let's see that. So, you want to find that frequency value for which the amplitude is maximum, right? So once I differentiate dA as a function of omega and set it to zero to find that value of omega, it comes out to be omega m is omega naught times one minus one over two q squared to the power one half, if I remember correctly. So just like differentiating this, setting it to zero, solving for omega m, this is what we get. Okay, not the case. So for one thing is clear, as long as q is positive, this thing is less than omega naught. It's like one minus some positive number. And as q goes up, this piece goes down, and therefore omega m approaches omega naught. You see that? Because for q infinity, one over q squared is zero, and omega equals omega naught. So therefore these peaks are shifting back. And if you can also find the value of the amplitude at that max point, you'll find that as Q goes up, these values also go up. Any other questions? All good? With me? Okay. All right. Examples. Let's think about LIGO. These people did electro gravitational waves a few years ago, all of themselves. But what they did was really fantastic because if you're looking for gravitational wave signatures across an interferometer which detects how <coughs> the space time itself is compressing and expanding, there are these vibrations going on, right? Because a gravitational wave is a wave, it's oscillating, it's propagating. Now, to detect them on the Earth here, we must somehow isolate our experiment or our instrument from ground motion, 
right, from just the smallest of ground motions. An animal walking by can cause enough oscillation in the Earth's surface to mess up with their signal. Okay? So you have to be very, very precise about what you are measuring and how do you isolate the LIGO's detecting instrument from any sort of vibration. Okay? Earthquakes, you speaking, you walking by, anything happening. Okay? So they have these seismic isolation stacks, which as the name suggests, are made to isolate seismic oscillations. Okay? Seismic oscillation stacks. Okay. So what they do is they have the earth. Okay? The earth can oscillate and vibrate. And this is my actual experiment, let's say. It's on a tabletop, which I do my experiment on. It's not the season, but <laughs> Let's keep it easy for now. Okay, that's my experimental paper now. I have one spring which connects around it. Okay. So when the earth moves, even my experiment moves because of the spring connection. Okay. And the spring constant here is k. And I know the fact that, let's say the earth oscillates vertically. There's some, uh, some earthquake or some, some uh, perturbation, and the earth is oscillating given by, it displaces, let's say by a variable, um, I don't know what the Greek letter that is, or call it something else. Let's just call it that. We call it that, okay? <laughs> That's the name, that. I'm forgetting what the Greek letter is, but I like to make this thing. So, that variable is what the ground is oscillating with. It's some amplitude, which is a known number here. It's not A of omega, it's a known constant <coughs> times cosine omega t. So this thing is known to you. Okay? So that is known. That the earth is shaking, it's vibrating at some amplitude value a and some frequency of the earthquake omega. Okay? Now what I want is that I want to isolate my experiment from this oscillation such that, what you mean by that, that the motion of this experimental tabletop is much, much less than A. Okay? <coughs> that if the amplitude of the, of the ground motion is A, I want my stack to not move as much as A. It should be much, much less than A. Okay? Do we all see what, where we headed? Okay. And of course, it will be a, you want to damp it out, right? You want to damp this transfer of motion to the tabletop by a damping mechanism. You could submerge this whole thing in a fluid, but you won't be able to breathe then. So what we'll do is, we'll put a thing called a dashboard. So it's something like there's a piston, and there's a fluid in here connected with this. And as these things move, this piston goes through the fluid, and it gets damped out. Okay? So that's, that's a dashboard, which damps things out. And it has some damping coefficient um, uh, gamma corresponding to the mass m of the tabletop, of the experimental top. Okay? So, I want us to find the steady state behavior of this experimental tabletop under forced oscillation of the earth, of the ground. Are we all okay with that? At least the, the problem statement. We don't know how to solve it, but at least we know what we're doing. That this will oscillate. We want to find how the tabletop oscillates and then see for what conditions can I tune things so that this thing oscillates much, much less than A, which is the amplitude of my forced oscillation. Okay? All right. So how do we go about it? Thoughts? This seems hard. It's not, it's not the most famous. Thing. <coughs> so what's the first thing that you want to do? Um, like set up our like, diffusion. Differential equation. That's always what we do. Excellent. If you don't know anything else, just write the differential equation. That's half of what. You're good to go. Uh, write the differential equation. That's the equation of motion. That will tell you how to start off with things. Okay. Now it's a differential equation for what? For the stable top. Okay. So let's call it this. So again, put variables down. Don't be scared to assign variables. <coughs> I don't know what the displacement is. Just call it something. Okay. You're gonna call it x. So this displaces by x. Okay. So I want to write an equation. Mx double dot. The equation of motion for this, 
for the stable top, x sub minus the stable top, where the displacement from its equilibrium position is x. Okay, physically, what forces are there on this experimental table top? So there's a spring force. Excellent. So there'll be a spring piece. This will be equal to there'll be a spring bar. What else? There's a damping force. Damping term because of the dashboard. It's connected to the to the table top. So there'll be a damping piece. Then gravity. Excellent. There'll also be a gravitational. Uh, component to that, but we can take care of that by shifting my equilibrium position. Does that make sense? No. No? Um, quick aside, if that doesn't make sense, maybe we can just do it here. Okay. So, say that I just had a pendulum on a spring with a mass hanging down, okay? So this is my, this is, I think, our recitation 2 or something. I discussed this. So the spring's natural length is L naught. The moment I hang a mass of mass m, it extends over L naught, okay? And then it stops again. That's the new equilibrium position of the spring. So this, let's say, went down by x naught, okay? And it stopped there now. So at this new equilibrium position, what, what's my, what are my forces? <coughs> there is mg pointing down and there's kx not pointing out, okay? So f at the equilibrium has to vanish because it's at equilibrium, it's sustained there. The forces are mg pointing down and kx not pointing up. So at equilibrium, mg equals kx not, okay? And then if I further displace this by my delta x, let's say. So I further displace this out by Sorry for my bad board work here, but I hope you get the idea. So it's facing over and above the new equilibrium, delta x. I'm looking for m x double dot equals, what are the forces? Gravity, mg. What is the spring force now? Minus k. What's the net displacement? x naught plus delta x. Okay. So this is k times x naught plus delta x. And mg equals kx naught. So this cancels with the x naught piece. And all that you have remaining is m delta x double dot is minus k delta x. Okay, so gravity can be shifted out by changing my equilibrium position. Are we all okay with that? Okay, if you're not, um, ask me after class or go back to your notes from the second recitation or assume there is no gravity. <laughs> that also works. Okay, so that's it. That was like that. Any other force? <coughs> yes. Will be the force of the oscillation of the curve. Will there? And that's the key point. Okay. Might be we are thinking that there might be because there's some oscillation. It's connected, but and then but there must be the a dash force. Part, like, that out, right? We don't know that yet. It'll have a. It'll have some effect. Okay. Right now, it's most generic. Just the forces, and by the forces we mean. Physical forces acting on this experimental tabletop. And forces only happen when things are connected. So the spring <laughs> connects the tabletop, hence the spring force is the actual physical force. The dash part connects the tabletop, there's a damping piece. The role that this oscillation of the earth plays is to change the oscillation values of these springs. The Earth's motion has no direct effect on the tabletop by itself. It's through the spring force and through the dashboard force. Okay? And what do I mean by that? Let's see. So what's the spring force? So for a configuration where the tabletop moved up by x, the Earth went up by that variable, what is the spring force? I can put the minus k down. What's the displacement of the spring which gets you that force? Don't be scared to assume things. Yes. This is it a combination of the displacement from the earth and the table? Exactly. So Excellent. Plus, like, um, so let's assume that x. So I'm assuming for my equation writing, math will take care of everything else. So 
we assume for the time being that x is more than that. Okay? If x went up by a value more than that, what's the net extension of the string? x minus that, right? So the spring force depends on the extension of the spring itself. So it's minus k times x minus. So now did we see how the oscillation of the earth is entering the equation of motion for the oscillation of the tabletop. Okay? It's not directly, it's, there's, a, there's not some piece just going like that. It has to go through the forces, through the physical forces. Okay? Um, damping part. It's viscous damping. There's a coefficient damping B. I should probably call this B, not gamma. This is B for the for the dash part. What else? B times what? It's B times the, the speed. Speed of the oscillation itself. Okay? And that's oscillating at its the net displacement is x minus that. Okay? So this is B D T of x minus that. The velocity of the displacement, okay, proportion to this thing is what the, the damping term is. And that is my equation of motion. Okay, that, that wasn't trivial. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Do we see what happened? Physically, mathematically, conceptually, everything. This is important because often force oscillations would go through other physical mechanisms to look like an effective oscillation force for the x displacement. Everyone with me? Can I get some nods? Okay. Question. Do you have that point that you moved up and down by the Earth's oscillation as well? Uh, so the way we do it is that we kind of connect the piston inside. I think like more technically, like more experimentally. This thing doesn't probably move. This piston thing moves inside the fluid, and hence it damps it out. So I would just like to explain that this thing should move inside the fluid, and not the whole box. Yeah. Make sense? Okay, good. So, all right. That looks horrible as it is. What do we do? Define new variables. I have things which look like x minus that. Let's call that a new variable, x minus that as a new variable. So let's call capital X as X minus okay. in, in this terms, little x is capital X plus that. Okay. So what's M little x double dot? So M little x double dot is M <coughs> capital X double dot. I should write better little x's to make it distinguished plus m times that double dot. <coughs> That's my left hand side of the equation. Is that okay? Okay, all right. Right hand side is minus k. Little x minus that is capital X. And minus d times ddt of little x minus that is capital X. So it's dx dot, capital x dot. And lo and behold, I have m capital X double dot from this piece, plus K, um, let me put the B piece first, plus B X dot plus K capital X equals minus M that double dot. Is that okay? So this is capital X double dot plus gamma capital X dot plus omega naught squared capital X equals what? The M's cancel off, that's all right. What's that double dot? How do I get that? We already know what that is. That is the oscillation of the earth. We are given it some constant A times cosine omega t. I'm doing a double differential to the minus sign, what do I get? Two derivatives pulls out a minus omega squared with a minus from my equation, that's a plus. So it's omega squared times A cosine omega t. 
that look good. And now if you like, just look at this. And that's a forest harmonic castle. Just compare it with what we had before. The double dot, single dot, variable itself times some driving term. The amplitude depends on omega, which is fine, but it's it's a value. Okay. Questions about that? Did that help in understanding the question? So, <laughs> in my equations, I had x minus that, right? It looks horrible. I just defined it to be capital X. Oh, in the diagram, you really can't see it because it's a, it's a difference between this displacement from the equilibrium minus this. So if, okay, that, as a physical picture, if you were standing on the ground, okay, if you were this person, from your perspective, <laughs> this would be the, actually, no, hold on, this is, this is not true. Um, yeah, okay, if you were in outer space, yeah, not on the earth, if you're in outer space, it's like looking at this whole thing, the ground also moving, and the x also moving, okay. So from your perspective, that you define the original zero of the ground, in those regards, what the net displacement is, is the, is the displacement. You see that? It's, it's two things. The, the ground moved up, and that thing moved up by itself. The net, how much it moved, is x minus that. You see it now? Okay. I should not have called it that. <laughs> but do we all see the equation of motion? Um, so in there you have it as omega squared uh, cosine omega t. So mm -hmm. then in there it's uh, with the e exponential. How do you like relate those? So, like, do you have to modify the amplitude or yes? Do you just yes. So if you want to go to the complex plane, um, this looks like z double dot plus gamma z dot plus omega naught squared z equals omega squared a e to the i. Right, because the real part of this gives you this. Okay. <coughs> Only difference being that the amplitude of the first part also depends on omega now. But that's fine, right? It's just some some number, depends on omega and the actual oscillation of amplitude. Okay? So I have a first oscillator. What is the solution? The steady state solution. So, capital X as a function of time. What is that? First question Does it have these non driven pieces or not? No, because I'm looking for the steady state solution. I have waited for all these non force turns to damp out, the complementary pieces damp out, all that remains is just the steady state solution. And again, notice this A of omega is some amplitude which depends on omega. Our A here is a number. So, again, I could have done a better job at my notation here, but I want to confuse you. So, it's some C of omega, some amplitude which depends on the frequency, like the first oscillator, times cosine omega t minus delta, which depends on omega t. Okay. What is <coughs> c? What is c as a function of omega? <coughs> Just by looking at this and knowing the fact that c of omega is the amplitude of the steady state force oscillation, what do you do? Compare again. To get this A of omega, what did we do? We took the, the amplitude of the driven piece, divided out by this whole horrible looking thing. Okay. Similarly here, the amplitude here is omega naught square A. This is omega naught square A, divided by the same old things. So now I have omega naught square minus omega square 
squared, so that's gamma squared, omega squared to the power of 1. You all see that? Take a minute. Forced oscillator, forced oscillator. What changed? Just what the amplitudes were by itself. Okay. Here A is a number, then A of omega was my frequent, uh, amplitude to be determined by the oscillation frequency, yet I'm calling it C of omega. It's C of omega. Uh, do you all see that? Any questions? Please feel free to ask. Because your question on the homeworks, midterm, homework, they all depend on things like these. And if you not like think about it in a systematic way, which is what I'm gonna teach you in this course, getting to this point is not a one-liner, but it's not out of hand either. All with me? Okay, question. Um, so the omega is not omega not the driving force? No, this is the so this omega is yeah. the oscillation frequency at which the earth is moving. Right. So on the on the right side. Oh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. That's an omega squared. Okay? So now I have a solution for capital X. Capital X is little x minus that. So, what does that become? So, so what is little x? Little x is capital X plus that. Now, capital X we just found in the steady state to be C of omega, which we determined, times cosine omega t minus delta as a function of omega. You can also get delta by the same method, gamma omega over the same thing, you all know that, plus that. And that was A times cosine omega t. That is the net oscillation of my experimental tabletop Given the oscillation frequency, its determined amplitude, which depends on the driving frequency, natural frequency is uh, amplitude of the Earth's oscillation A, this is what I have. Okay? And again, in the interest of time, I can um, tell you that the amplitude of X, so max of X, If you work it out, it turns out that this is this is um, equal to a when omega squared equals two omega naught squared. It is more than a when omega squared is less than two omega naught squared, and it's less than a when omega squared is more than two omega naught squared. Okay, you just work out the maximums and see how it looks like as, as a function of omegas. And what you realize is that if my driving frequency of the Earth's oscillation is higher, is much higher than omega naught, my maximum displacement of the table top is much less than A. So despite the fact that if the Earth is oscillating with some amplitude A, it gets isolated for large frequencies and the oscillation of the table top itself is much smaller than A, the maximum of that. <coughs> okay? So that's how LIGO uses multiple. So I had like one, one setup, like a one spring thing. LIGO uses multiple set stacks. So if this is reducing it down by some factor, you have another spring, keep on going, so on and so forth. It just puts the amplitude down very, very precisely. Okay? Does that make sense? All with me? Okay. All right. I want some quick advice from you folks. Can you help me out? So you know this road outside uh, uh, this building here, Arden Road, Arden in California, right? Where the health center is. So on Arden Road, I don't know why, but they have a bunch of bumps on the road. <laughs> have you <we> seen that? <coughs> Driven by bike tag, whatever. It's just filled with bumps for some reason, and I just don't like it. Okay? So, one day I was bored and annoyed, 
I went and measured the distance between these bumps. That's grad school. That's what you do in a PhD. So, so don't tell anyone I said that. Okay, so on, on Arden Road, it's, it has these little bumps and so on. And I went and measured the distance between the top of each bump. And I found that this was roughly 14 meters. I'm not kidding. Or am I? So the bumps were 4.2 meters thick. Okay. Now, when I was younger, I didn't have a car, but I had a bike. And I was a rash driver on the bike. So I was going down one day at a speed of around 8 meters per second. That's me, yeah. All right, just losing body, 8 meters per second. So these bumps on Arden Road. Now, my bike, what it has, when I sit, so my seat basically, uh, and this would be hard to draw, but you know, so, so that's the that's the seat where I sit. Okay. And it has a little spring suspension system, right, in the, in the seat to absorb shocks and stuff. So that's how I'm sitting on the bike, and I'm going down at this speed. And let's say the, the, the mass of the, the seat is 50 kgs. It's an old bike, one of the heavy ones. 50 kgs for the, for the, for the seat. And myself, uh, let's say I'm 70, okay? Let's not go beyond that. So that's, that's myself. So the total mass of myself and the, and the seat is 120 kgs, okay? And I'm going down at eight meters per second. This is myself of the bike. That's Arden Road. What I want to know is that, am I living the good life, just like enjoying myself, or should you call 911? Do we first see the reason why one might need to call 911? There is a natural oscillation frequency at which things are oscillating on the road. Um, actually, hold on, let me see the other way around. For myself, since I'm in the system, there is some natural oscillation frequency of the spring system. Okay? Let's say the spring has a spring constant k, and k is about 2000 newtons per meter. Standard spring in the, in, the, in, the, in the market. So I have my natural oscillation frequency on the bike, and I am being forced to drive on a road which has some other frequency at which these bumps come up. Yes? For the purposes of the picture, does the road <coughs> follow the sign, or is it like flat there? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of like goes like that. Okay. But the bumps are that place apart. So it's kind of going to maximize. This is like an order of magnitude calculation. It's not a precise calculation. It's a kind of give you a sense of how things are working. But the bumps happen periodically, and they're placed 4.2. So I have a natural oscillation frequency from my own spring system on the bike, and there is some frequency of oscillation on the road. Okay? So I can imagine that if they both match up, there is resonance, and then <laughs> go there. So how do I how do I see what's going on? What's the frequency at which the bumps How long does it take me to get from one bump to the next bump? I have, this is the 4.2 meters. Speed is 8 meters per second. So delta t between these two bumps is about half a second. Okay. So the, the driven period, omega, is 2 pi over delta t, which you can solve as a number. Okay. What's my natural frequency? What's my natural frequency f naught in hertz? Let's find that first, in hertz. Okay, f goes step by step. What's omega naught? Root k over m. Okay, k is 2000 divided by 120, square root. How much is that? No one knows. Did I, did I solve this somewhere? Yeah, I, I take care of myself, so you know. It's about so, okay, work this out, and you find this, you plug it back into f, which is 1 over 2 pi omega naught, just changing between hertz and, and radians per second, and this is about 2.1 hertz, okay? That's f naught. What's f? <coughs> the driven frequency, it's 1 over delta t. So 1 over delta t, so it's about 
two seconds. Did I get that right? Two hertz. So my natural oscillation on the seat is about two hertz, and the road is also sitting at two hertz, roughly. So you better combine them more, right? The point here being that there are resonances, there are structures which look like forced oscillations in the most weirdest places. Bridges have forced oscillations. Like the Bay Bridge in, in San Francisco, they have these big beams used to damp out these resonances and things like that. Okay? So this is not some random calculation really helped me out one day. Not. But uh, I hope you get the point. We all see it? Okay. I'm not going to be talking about questions. Yes, that's a good question. So here I'm assuming that there's a light heat damp oscillator because it's a stream. So uh, should I should have mentioned that. Thank you. So this is the case where gamma is less than 2 omega naught. So it's lightly damped. But if it was overly damped, it would just fall down. It'll never even oscillate. Yeah. Okay, so how are we on time? We have about 10 minutes. So we will not talk about energy transfer today because um, the book does it very, very well. It's just a bunch of formulas derived, which Professor did in the lecture yesterday as well. I'm going to skip that. You won't need it much in the course, to be honest. And if you do, just look at the book. He does a fantastic job about talking about how these things work. Let's talk about circuits. That seems like the most key point of things. Okay. So think about a driven circuit. The homework has the following circuits. I want to kind of make the distinction very clear. The homework has a parallel RLC circuit. <coughs> and what I have there, I'm sending in a current, I of t as I naught cosine um, I'm sending the current on the main branch, and we ask you to find, I don't know, the, the current through one of these or something is to be asked in the homework. This is the homework setup, okay? What I'm doing here today is something slightly different. Think about this circuit. Um, think about a capacitor in parallel with a combination of an inductor and a resistor in series. And this time, I don't have a current specified on the main branch. I am fixing the voltage across these branches. Okay? So when you try and do the homework, don't just copy paste what I do today. It'll be different. But the ideas will also apply. Okay? So this is for your homework, this is what we do. <coughs> so this is the voltage across my circuit. L R C. What do you do? <laughs> start assuming, start writing variables down. Okay? Assume there is some current I of t in my main branch, which I don't know. I'm specifying the voltage difference, not specifying the current in the main branch. Okay? They're of course connected in a certain way, but this is a message right now. I hit a junction, what happens? Current divides up the junction. Some current I1 goes through the, the lower branch, some current I2 goes to the upper branch. Okay. Well, what can I say about I1 plus I2? This equals Ft. Even like I1 depends on time, I2 depends on time, junction this. Okay. That's one equation. I don't know what I of t is. In the homework, you would know that. What else can we do in the circuit? Like what's my other approach now? Sum of voltages. In this case, across these points, these points, and these points, it's the same voltage. Right? Because wires have no resistance, I'm fixing the voltage across these two points, and hence that's the voltage across these two, across these two. Okay? Let me call this point A, call this point B, call this point C, call this point D. Just labeling points for my own needs. Okay? What's B sub A minus B sub B. B A minus B B. How much 
Thomas is that. <coughs> across this entire branch, not just one element for the whole. How do you do that? Let's think about the loop ring. Let's think about a loop in the lower branch of the surface, which includes the, the driving voltage, the L and the R. Okay? So in this loop, if I go around here, I start from the lowermost point at some, at some low point. <laughs> This is this point, let's say. I go up, I cross an inductor with the current, so it's minus L I1 dot, <coughs> minus I1 R. I come down, I go from, let's say, plus to minus, so the current is going this way, plus V of T. Okay? So in this case, let me just kind of directly get there that I wanted to. So V A minus V B is. Um, is L I1 dot plus I1 dot. It's the voltage difference across this branch, which depends on the inductance and how the current is changing, L, D, I, D, T, and R. Okay? And going from positive to negative voltage because current is this way, hence I have plus signs here. Okay? And since this is the same voltage across the, the first piece, this is V of T. You all see that? Voltage across here is voltage across here is voltage across here. Okay? What's VC minus VD? On the top part. Assume a charge on the capacitor. Plus Q of T minus Q of T. Current is flowing I2 this way. So this is Q of T over C. Again, this is V of T. This is V naught cosine. Are we all okay with that? Mm -hmm. Everyone. Okay? And again, if you're not, Sunday, there's a review. I didn't think I mentioned in the subject class. But yeah. Come on Sunday at 2 p.m. for the math dash physics review in 201 East Bridge. We talk about circuits, special equations, complex numbers, a bunch of stuff. All right. So if I have these equations, can I find I2? <coughs> the current in the upper branch across the capacitor. What do I do? I have an equation for Q. I want to find I2, the current in that branch. So I2 is just Q dot. You all see it? Okay. If I2 is Q dot, I know what Q is. It's V0 times C times cosine omega T. So I2 is just um, minus V naught C omega cos omega T. Yes. Where does the negative come? Uh, differentiate cosine. Oh, I guess so. minus sine. <coughs> oh, sorry. sine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, minus sine. We got I two. So I know as a function of time what the current in the upper branch is. What about the, the lower branch? How do I get I1? I have an equation for I1. The equation on top. It says I1 dot plus R over L I1 equals V naught over L cosine omega T. It's a first order differential equation. It's not a second order differential equation. Okay? In the homework, when you have it with a driven current, you find a second differential equation pop up. But here I'm specifying the voltage, and hence I have a first order which comes up. That's what it is. Okay? Can we all solve this? Same method, complementary solution. Could the should we do it in class or like two minutes to solve this equation through? Okay. So I want to solve. I1 dot plus, I'm going to call it R over L, I1 equals 
V naught over L cosine omega t, split it, the complementary part, I1 dot plus R over L I1 equals 0, the homogeneous equation. How do I solve for this? The answer is guess, okay? And again, you have differentials equal to a 0, guess it to be an exponential function because they are stubborn functions. So again, your answer here is that I1 is some constant that many call this A times um, e to the i e to the alpha. You want to find alpha? Going back like last week's start when we did damped oscillators, assume some coefficient, plug it back, and then solve for alpha. What do you get? What's i1 dot? Pulls down alpha times i1 again. So this is alpha plus r over l. <coughs> I just plug this back in. The first term pulls the alpha down. Second term doesn't pull the alpha down. It always has a e to the alpha on both pieces equal to zero. That cancels off. So alpha is minus r over l. Okay. So my complementary solution, i one t, is a e to the minus r over l plus. You want a two constants, so you can here. Just like kind of plug it up. Yeah, just like two constants there. Hold on, my bad. It has to be one constant. Sorry, yeah. See, you get confused. Just one constant because it's first differential equation. Just one derivative, hence one constant. That's my capital A. So my solution is I1 is A e to the minus R over L. T. So for alpha T. We all see that? That's the complementary solution with the unknown coefficient a, determined by initial conditions. How do I get the particular solution? <coughs> I1 dot plus r over l, I1 equals v naught over l cosine omega t. To get the, uh, the particular solution, again, you guess, you glare at the right hand side, inhomogeneous piece. Let I1 go like the same kind of a function. So I guess I want t, the particular solution, to be um, some unknown constant to determine v times cosine omega t plus, let uh, me call this v2, v1 times sine omega t. You want a general trigonometric function then. Because the g of t, the inhomogeneous <laughs> is a trigonometric function. Guess it to be at the same frequency omega. Plug it back and solve for B1. <coughs> okay? And the final result is the complementary part with the unknown constant A plus the particular piece where B1 and B2 would get determined by plugging it back here. Okay? So the point here being that a circuit like this has a first order function equation, one constant, work it out. Similarly, for the homework, write the junction rules. Write the voltage rules, connect them into a differential equation, it'll be second order there, solve for it. So to get like, if you wanted to have like one i to describe this, would you go back to the i plus i2 plus i2? Like, exactly, if you want to connect that, you just add them. Okay, so see you guys on uh, Wednesday. Have a good weekend.